So first of all, hello everyone. Uh, I'm AJ Patel, CEO of SMA. My co-host is Jacques Keats, our Chief Operating Officer. And we also have a handful of other individuals here that are gonna help us uh, through the next hour to take a look at the chat window and just see if anyone has questions during the hour. First of all, welcome to our global town hall at SMA. Uh, we actually have a very large audience. Uh, we really wanna encourage you to ask questions. So if you have a question, just go to the participant list. One of the icons on Zoom is kind of, you can see who all the participants are. And on the bottom left of that, you have, uh, you have some icons there. There's a way for you to raise your hand and we have folks who will be um, monitoring that list to see if anyone has a question. Also, just use the chat window. It's, uh, offer comments, post a question, let us know if you wanna speak or just let us know if, you know if you're having a good time. So let's make use of the chat window and the uh, participant list in terms of raising your hand. We really wanna make this interactive. It's, it'll be a fun hour. Thanks. So today's uh, topic is on self-efficacy and leadership. This is uh, it's a particularly central theme at SMA. It has been for our 40-year history, it's an, and it's an, a particularly important topic today, as more professionals are considering project-based work instead of a traditional career. A recent article in Harvard Business Review by Joe Fuller discusses the trend of more skilled professionals like ourselves, you know, opting into a gig career to accelerate our professional growth, uh, just to have the opportunity for more fulfilling work, or frankly, just to have control over our work-life balance. Now, Peter F. Drucker is considered the father of modern management. He wrote an article in 1999, it was uh, first published in 1999, called Managing Oneself. Uh, the seminal work is, an, it's an easy but an incredibly powerful read. It's about managing our careers by taking responsibility for professional growth, and knowing how and when to change what we do, something which we should all be a bit proactive about during the 50-year working life that most of us will probably experience. So our guest today is Professor Bernie Jaworski. He holds the prestigious Peter F. Drucker Chair at the Claremont Graduate School. Bernie, welcome. Can you, can you give us a bit of an overview of Drucker's philosophy on this topic? What does he actually mean by managing oneself? So whenever you bring in a professor, there goes the whole 50 minutes, AJ. So the, the danger here is, is inviting me to the talk. But there's basically five questions you need to ask yourself. Number one is, what are my strengths? What am I good at? It's not enough for you to ask that stuff. You need to ask others what you're good at, uh, and they'll be more likely to lean in around where they think you're strong and weak. So the idea is not simply self-assessment, but use diagnostic tools, talk to others, trying to figure out what your strengths are. The second is, how do I work best? Do I work alone? Do I work in teams? Uh, in the olden days, there was something called an office. You guys may remember this, where there's actually a physical location you went to. Do you like to work at home? Where do you, so what's the environment? What's the context that allows me to work best? Third is, what are my values? Now, there are certain values, integrity, trust, that you expect everybody to follow, but you may have very specific values that you think about that say, this is really who I am. Uh, so, for example, it may be that you're very generous. You know, generosity is a very unique value, right? So, what are my values? The fourth question is, where do I belong? And, and that's a function of the first three. What are my strengths? How do I work best? What are my values? So, the Venn diagram overlap of those three allow you to ask the question, where do I belong? Where am I best able to kind of leverage all of my talents and strengths and values? And then the final question is, once you're inside of an organization, you need to ask yourself, what can I contribute? And this is the most profound idea, which is every single knowledge worker needs to sit down and think, what does my boss need? What does my division need? And most importantly, what is the purpose and mission of my organization? Given the purpose and mission of the organization, given the strategy of my division, given what my boss and work group needs to achieve, what can I contribute? So the responsibility for figuring out your contribution begins with you, the worker. Now, this is the exact opposite of command and control, where someone from I above says, here are the division objectives. Hey, Bernie, here are your objectives. Go to work. Now, if you think about that, that gives me a job description and a set of objectives to achieve, but it doesn't really engage me. It doesn't really enable me. That is, I would argue that job descriptions typically get about 50% of the overall individual showing up at work each day. What you really wanna do is get 100% of them. And they need to lean in and figure out what is best for me in terms of given my strengths, given how I work, given my values, given the organization's goals, given the purpose, what should I be working on? And that's a conversation I have to have with my boss. It's not like I can determine it, 
but I start that conversation. I may say these are the first four objectives that I have this year. My boss might say, I like the first three, but I don't like the fourth one. What about number five? So now we go back and forth to try and figure out what is my overall contribution? What's it going to look like for the year? Now, that's complicated and very nuanced, but that is the, that's the essence. Those five questions, if you answer those five questions, you begin to start managing yourself, where the first four are about the context you work in, and then the fifth one is about what you do in order to really engage, enable, and to actually hit targets that make sense, not just for you, but for the overall organization. Now, the critical assumption for that fifth one is the organization does have a purpose and mission that's clear and does have a strategy that's clear. And I have a boss that has an idea of what they want to achieve. All of that assumes that that's in place, right? Because you're trying to align yourself with that overall purpose uh, and mission. So those are the five key questions, uh, AJ, that kind of Drucker talks about. Obviously, he has a book called The Effective Executive in 1967 that, that is probably the best book for any individual trying to figure out what they want to do to be an effective executive, effective manager. Mm -hmm. But this at least gives you a kind of a primer, kind of a short five-minute overview of the five key questions. And, and those are, to your point, they are profound questions and important questions. And, you know, Drucker wrote about the idea that you hire the whole human being, you know, all their strengths and all their weaknesses. He wrote about that in 1954. Today, we, we talk about strength finders and managing your strengths and mitigating weaknesses, right? right? But this was 1954. Uh, you know, this is way back when I was born. You know, this is like <laughs> centuries ago, you know, back in medieval times. So, so, you know, these ideas are profound because they're timeless. They're really timeless, right? You could give these to your kids and say, think about these issues, right? I mean, you know, I, I actually, I worry about these issues. Like, what do I do to contribute to my university, right? My university may want me to teach more. I may want to do more research, right? This is an interesting dialogue that has to have uh, unfold. So that's the opening salvo, uh, AJ. That's great. So on a, on a lighter note, Bernie, about what age do you recommend for us to use some of Peter Drucker's books as, as um, bedtime reading? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, my best, I, I'm going to tell, here are the two best, he's written 38 books. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, if you're going to buy two things, buy The Effective Executive, it's only about 120, 130 pages. It's mind blowing. And then buy the practice of management. It's a 1954 book. Okay. Uh, it's just, it's, they're both amazing. So yes, bedtime reading. Although, although now we have Netflix. So yeah, I don't know if bedtime reading even exists anymore, but, but there was a period of time where you had bedtime reading. I, I agree with you, but right. whether it exists anymore, who the heck knows? So, so Bernie, one of the things that you, you uh, referred to was kind of from the corporate perspective, right? And so, it, you know, that, what you said seems really clear, but um, boy, there's got to be some challenges in making it work. You know, like how would it actually work in a typical firm? It's very rare to see Drucker-like organizations uh, hmm. because they require an enormous amount of work. It's much easier to have a command and control structure where you say, okay, guys, here are the overall objectives. Ready? Go. Right? You're the sales guy in the field. You got this quota to hit this year and these particular performance targets. Ready? Go. Right? But what Drucker is saying is that, you, that that's actually not going to get you the best outcomes. It's only going to use probably 50% of your over human capital if you do that. You want to be able to leverage 100% of your, everybody leaning in aggressively around what they're really good at, right? And so the problem, the fundamental problem is if it's the knowledge worker who's close to the problem, who's defining the first pass of their objectives, and then having multiple conversations with their boss to achieve, that is a very hard thing to do. So the problem is managing the Drucker way is much more complicated, much more complex, and much more nuanced than traditional command and control. But on the other hand, it produces enormous outcomes uh, as a result. So I think organizations are, are you know, it's, it's just very difficult to, 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 um, to commit the time to do this. Now, one, one organization that Drucker School works with every year is Edward Jones. Edward Jones now has over 30,000 employees, and this is what they do. Uh, they, they, they don't, you know, they're not constrained by job descriptions, although there's job descriptions that exist, uh -huh. but they do, they practice, they, 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 they call it responsibility-based management. Okay? By the way, one small note on this, when Drucker coined the term management by objectives, what he meant was it's the worker who initiates. Uh -huh the objectives. So people think of management by objectives as management has the objectives and here they are. No, it's here's the overall purpose. The worker figures out their objectives and then they have a conversation with their boss around what the objectives 
should be, and then they agree. And at that point, what you need to do is you need to give that worker who's closest to the problem the ability to control through self-control, the ability hmm. to monitor oneself. Now, the, the only way that can work is you got to give that worker information and knowledge and feedback, but it's in contrast to our traditional control systems, which are here are the output targets, here are the process workflow targets, right? It's giving the worker the responsibility to manage themselves cool. uh, around the target. But again, I have to have the information in order for me to do that. Yeah. Very, very um, modern, advanced ideas from back in the 50s and 60s, I guess. Quite, quite interesting. So uh, why don't we go, there's a handful of questions. Why don't we go ahead and, uh, and, and see if we can address some of these questions. So um, uh, I'd see the first question I can see is that, uh, do you have any, Bernie, do you have any advice on self-directed learning? Uh, particularly, I think, I, I, I suppose, around these types of topics. Yeah, so <clears throat> what I would do on that, on that front is, I would, I would say, <laughs> where do I wanna be five years in the future? Where do I wanna be? to actually have a target, have a vision for yourself about where you want to be. Then I would do the diagnostic work to say, well, where am I now on that journey? Am I 30% of the way there? Am I 50% of the way there? And then if I'm only 50% of the way there, what are the skill sets and capabilities I need to develop to, in order to kind of get to that five-year target? Then the question is on self-learning, there are a number of different tools from lynda.com, actually LinkedIn Learning now. There's a number of really, really good uh, opportunities to kind of look at ways to kind of do the self-learning. The one data point that's relevant here, though, from a research perspective, is find a buddy. Uh, because if you do it on your alone, you're kind of learning, you're not as likely to complete the overall self-directed learning. Find a learning buddy that you can hold yourselves accountable in the same way you wouldn't doing workouts or in earlier heard about folks that are, are riding uh, uh, bikes and stuff. Uh, the same issue, right? So make wow. sure, you, even though it's self-directed, make sure you have a, a competent buddy that, that, that that's, goes along. That's a really interesting idea and an important point. Um, I think, and actually in, in the Managing Oneself, Peter F. Drucker referred to as some people, I think, learn and absorb information by reading, others by listening. You know, there's kind of different modalities here. And so that's probably plays into kind of how you might want to do some self-directed learning as well. And I think particularly important if you, it's a, it's a good point in terms of finding a buddy. So, um, Here's a really interesting and challenging question. Um, what, uh, what do you do if the corporate behavior differs from corporate values? And maybe even extend it to your own individual values. Yeah, uh, I think that's the really interesting challenge. Um, and so there, you can approach it at two levels of analysis. So I know companies that where when some senior executives are operating in ways that are, now this, let me, when senior executives are operating in ways that are inconsistent with the values, the yeah. organization calls them out. And if they're consistent about that and violating them, they actually demote them or fire them. And there's nothing better inside of an organization to basically to signal to others that these values are really important. So the first thing is that senior management needs to sit down and they need to take responsibility for when you have this violation of values. But you do see it. There's no question you see it. I think the second question is the individual level of analysis. So what happens if I'm observing some violation of our, of our values? Now, the interesting question is, do values matter? The very first question I'd say would be, if values matter, then if I'm having the right conversation with folks superior to me, we should be having a good conversation and we should be taking action based upon that. But if we don't take action, what that really tells me is the values don't matter. The values are just there, but they really don't matter. Now, now, this is highly problematic from a Drucker perspective, because Drucker had this wonderful quote that says, as people need vitamins, organizations need values. And so the values from Drucker's perspective are absolutely essential. But the question really, are they just interesting statements on the wall, or do we translate them into behaviors where we then evaluate people? And I know organizations that do this, that evaluate people on the values every year, the same way they evaluate their performance. You know, are they living the values you know, low, medium, high, and are they performing well, low, medium, high, and someone who's living the values and performing at a high level is a role model. Someone who's not living the values and performing below the performance targets is what we call unemployed. Uh, they're not gonna be around for <laughs> long. The interesting <laughs> questions are the off diagonals. What happens if you have somebody high performing who's not living the values, or somebody who's living the values but not performing well, right? Those are the tough conversations to have. Right, right. R really, really interesting. I think it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, many of us that have been in traditional companies and careers where 
we get frustrated with those large organizations, oftentimes it's because they're not behaving consistent. They're not enforcing their values, basically, right? And so I think the the case where you see companies enforcing values is is quite rare, actually. And and oftentimes it, it's only when that company gets to a precipice of some point. Um, there's a comment in the chat window that McDonald's uh, fired its CEO for vi for violating its values. Um, yeah, so, and that, that was a, that was an unambiguous case, you know. I think, that, <laughs> but you know, in terms of the violation, right? It, right. But there's but there's cases that are really kind of on the on the on the borderline. For example, one of my clients 20 years ago, or maybe not quite that long ago, was Cisco Systems. Mm -hmm. One of their values was frugality. That was a value. Yeah. It was corporate frugality, frugality. Okay. Now, what was interesting is everybody flew economy class, but a lot of the senior executives would say, "The hell with it. I'm gonna I'm gonna use some of my budget, or I'm actually gonna use my own personal expense to fly business or first. I mean, I'm not gonna. You know, they're they were pretty wealthy at this point since Cisco had kind of gone public. And, so now what is that? You know, are they really, what, what, what is that? Are they violating the values because they're spending their own resources? You know, so maybe it's not, but what does frugality mean? You know, so it's, these are really interesting to ask yourself, what are the behaviors that are associated with high frugality versus low frugality? And, and what does that mean? How does that translate into daily work life? Those are the conversations that, you, that are valuable and important to have. Otherwise the values are simply interesting high-level ideas as opposed to the behavior yeah. driving activity in New York. Yeah, our personal experience at SMA is quite interesting. Um, as, as you know, and, and many folks on this town hall know, this is my second version, second round at SMA. And uh, I guess about four years ago, we really, really realized that, uh, you know, the, the firm's always had a very distinct set of values. We refreshed it, but the firm had actually not been really consistent in enforcing its value. We actually started to enforce the values. And it, it, I think, as you mentioned, it had a very dramatic change in everyone's behaviors. And I think the firm became a lot more committed in terms of the individual commitment that, uh, that we had uh, towards our kind of our common success. So it's, it's a really important aspect here. Uh, uh, Melissa, do we, have, uh, do we have anyone that's raised their hands and wants to ask a question to the group? I don't see any hands raised, AJ. Okay, yeah, please, please go ahead and do that. If you'd like to There's a lot of questions still in the chat, though, AJ. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> we've got a well, lot of questions. Great topic, yeah. So um, <laughs> we, got, we have a few more minutes before we go to our next segment, which I promise actually will be quite fun. Um, and Bernie will stay on for the full hour, so we'll, we'll try to come back to, to uh, you know, more questions as they come up and the questions we can't get to. Um, there, there's, there's something here about, uh, I think there's a topic here about asking others about your strengths. How, how would you approach that? So I, I think, so, so first thing, and this is gonna be kind of surprising, go as broad as you can go. So what's interesting to me is, as an example, I, I, I know where most people are going, which is you wanna go above you in the organization, below you in the organization and sideways, right? Those are the people that are obvious that you need to ask about what your strengths are and what areas are you weak in, right? So above you, below you, and lateral, right? That's obvious. Now go outside that and begin to say to yourself, who else can I ask? Who else is, you know, you can ask the guys that you play tennis with. You can ask your children, right? There are some really interesting answers here. Of, 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 you know, I always find it incredibly interesting because I, you know, I certainly think I have certain strengths and certain weaknesses, but others view me differently. And I think, so go as broad and deep outside of the work context, inside of the work context, but also be very open to listening uh, to, to what they're saying, right? And, and ask follow on questions. If someone says, you're really good at communicating, what does that mean? You know, what does it mean when I stand in front of a group or when I'm in a small group or when I'm one-on-one? -on -one? Uh, and why, why would you say that? What, what is it that I'm doing, right? So you got to be asking the follow on why, why, why questions in order to kind of get to what right. you're good at. And, and by the way, what you're, so Drucker had this great idea. He said, when he looks at human resources, you got to look at it this way. Is it a human or is it a resource? If it's a resource, you just allocate it, you know, you're done. But if it's a human being, it means you get the entire person their emotions, their character, their, their weaknesses, their, you know, all, and everybody has weaknesses. Everybody has weaknesses, right? Uh, and uh, so you got to figure out how do you mitigate those, right? And whether that's building a strong team or other things that you kind of do along the way, right? But, but, you know, basically the idea here is, you know, don't spend a lot of time on your weaknesses, you know, spend time <laughs> building your strengths. That's what you really want to do. Unless you're complete derailers. That's going to take a lot of courage. 
to take a lot of courage. It's going to take a lot of courage. <laughs> there was, particularly if you're going to ask your spouse, I think, uh, about what your strengths are. <laughs> yeah, that, that would be a very small bucket. Uh, the <laughs> large bucket would be the weaknesses. The, uh, <laughs> so, uh, I, we've got a few more. We've got a little bit of time for a few more questions. Um, uh, here's an interesting one. What, what is the impact from IT on the concepts that Drucker you know, talks about in managing oneself? So Drucker back in the late 90s saw the evolution of technology and then it was going to be much, much more significant. And what he said was, it's not that technology is going to replace workers, it's going to put more demands on the worker. Uh, and if you think about that, that, that's, you know, you think about the SMA uh, talent on demand platform. Mm -hmm. that's the, the, every worker inside of SMA had, has more demands in the beginning. Now, obviously, over time, you're going to make your job a lot easier. But at time period one, it's like, oh, you know, I got to lean in and figure out all this new technology and get it all to work, right? So it does place more demands on me. Now, the good news is, assuming it all works right, six, 12 months in the future, my life's much, much better, right? But so I think that's, I think it, for the knowledge worker, uh, which, by the way, that, that's Drucker's phrase. Drucker coined the yeah. phrase knowledge worker technology is an enablement. It's something we're going to use in order to facilitate how it is that we engage in activities that capitalize on our, on our brains, capitalize on our mind, capitalize on how it works. So technology to me is a, something that we need to account for and something that we can actually, uh, that can, that, that's going to place a lot more demands on me, but it's going to lead to better productivity over time. Yeah, um, I want to get to two more questions here before we uh, before we uh, go to our next segment, and then we'll we'll come back. Uh, so, so one of them is a really interesting question. Uh, um, so, does it make sense to hire to hire based on values, actually above prioritized above experience or fit? Uh, yes. That was a simple yes. <laughs> 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 you get, the values are the most important thing. Yeah. Actually, there's two things, actually. It's, it's, you've you got to really work hard on your purpose and mission and vision and make sure you really have your act together. And then if they have values that are completely aligned, those have to take priority. You can train for skill. You can train right. for activities, right? So, yes. But sitting on top of values is you've got to have a really clear purpose, vision, and mission. Hmm. That's not half-baked, but it's actually really, really carefully articulated based upon a set of principles that is for the next time we get together, AJ, but, but it's, you know, you got, you got, you got to have your act together in those. So, so when we come back, you know, maybe an interesting question is how do you actually test for that? Right. <laughs> it's a great question. You know, it's a great question, you know, and uh, I, here, here, once what, what I would be doing is I would be organizing these around behavioral anchors. So if I have a set of values that are, let's say it's frugality uh, and let's say in a one to 10 point scale, I would articulate behaviors, for the workforce that are a one, that are a five and a 10. And in the, in the interview, I'd be having, having conversations around, you know, what is the, what does good look like? You know, what is a behavior that is consistent with this? What, what are we looking for here? And are these behaviors that you're comfortable with? Because this is what, this is what happens inside of this organization, right? Fantastic. You know, it, well done values should be forcing choices around who, who wants to be part of that organization or not, you know? Excellent. So, Excellent. Well, thank you, Bernie, and uh, thank you for uh, be willing to hang on for the for the full hour here. I'm sure we'll we'll get a chance to come back to you. So, right now, our next segment, we're going to actually have quite a bit of fun here. Our next guest is Ben Seidman. Ben is from Los Angeles. He appeared on Penn and Teller Fool Us. Guest stars on the Netflix show Brainchild. He was also the resident magician at one of the very well known top resorts in Las Vegas. Please give a huge welcome to Ben. Hello, everyone. Hey, Hi. Ben. Nice to see you guys. Same here. Uh, before I begin, I'm going to choose someone. I'm just going to look over gallery view and I'm going to pick. How about Tara? Tara or Tara Kawala? Something. Tara, how's it going? Will you unmute Tara and say hi? Hi, I'm also on my phone because the computer isn't working by itself. <laughs> I understand. We're, we're doing whatever we can. Uh, is it Tara or Tara? It is Tara. Tara, nice to meet you. Tara, I want you to name a playing card. Do you have a favorite playing card from a deck of cards? The Ace of Clubs. The Ace of Clubs. It's a very common card. Did you know this? A lot of people go with Aces. No. <laughs> a lot of people go with Aces. Do you want to change your mind? Give me a different one. Nope. Are you, no, I mean, honestly, Aces are most common. That would make this very okay. easy. Give me, give me okay. a different one. 
So a seven of spades. Seven of spades, the second most popular card. Here's the thing. <laughs> I absolutely knew you're going to pick those cards. And the reason I knew is because of simple psychology. I put a bunch of cards from a deck of cards in a wine glass here. And uh, what's more important to me than you just naming one is that we choose a card with multiple people. Because if it's just one person, it's going to look set up. So Tara, all of that aside, you get to choose whether we're going to use a black card or a red card. Choose very carefully. Red. Red card. Are you sure? Absolutely. Okay, cool. Let's go to, uh, to Bernie. I heard you speak for a moment there, Bernie. How's it going? Um, Good. I would love to, because Tara said a red card, would you like to use a heart or a diamond? Totally up to you. Let's do diamond. Diamonds. I like your style, man. They are a girl's best friend. We're going to go with diamonds. And then let's see, who else can I pick on here? How about, uh, how about Steven? Steven Bott. Hello, Steven. Will you give me the value of a playing card? Hearts, clubs, spades, or diamonds? Eight. The eight. So that would be the eight of diamonds. Are you sure? Sure. Okay, fair enough. Now, all of you have, obviously, the spotlight has jumped around, but you can see that I've been here the whole time. I haven't done anything fishy. You had a free choice. You started with the color, the suit, and then we got to the eight of diamonds. It was totally up to you. Would it be amazing if in this wine glass, the first card, the top card that it's been there the entire time in view, would it be amazing if this was the eight of diamonds? Yeah, yes. indeed. Yeah, it would be yes. cool, but you might think that I manipulated it somehow. So it's got to be better than that. It has to be better. It has to be better. So I'm going to choose one more person here, and I'm going to not spotlight you because I want you to keep all eyes on the cards. Let's go with Brian Murray. Brian, will you <sighs> unmute? Brian, please unmute and say hi. Hey, good morning, uh, afternoon. Hey, how's it going, Brian? You're yeah. going to give us, because there's 52 cards in a deck of cards, you're going to give us between 1 and 52, any number you'd like. 17. 17, fair enough. So keep your eye on these cards. You had a free choice, yes? I'm going to keep everything in view and we're just going to count. 17 cards. That would be one. That would be two. Three. Thank God you didn't say 51. That would be four, five. This one's six. That's the sixth card. This is seven, right? This is eight, nine, 10. You said 17, correct? 11, this is 11, 12, this is the 13th card. This right here, that is the 14th card. This is the 15th card, the 16th card. And then you'll notice the 17th card looks different. Isn't that interesting? You could have said any number you want. You said 17, but the 17th card looks different than the rest. I'm going to grab the other ones to show you genuinely. You could have chosen any of these. You could have chosen any of these. It was totally up to you. But you said 17. And what was the card that we all chose together? You said red. You said diamonds. What was that value you said? Eight. It was the eight. Eight. So if this was the eight of diamonds, that would be insane. <laughs> no way. Awesome. <laughs> I like how the moment that happened, Christina Louise left the meeting. She was like, I can't handle this. This is too much. <laughs> I'm the creator of Star Wars. Oh, I see that. I'm the creator of Star Wars. Avatar was my story also. Wow. Okay. That's very exciting. These are, these are my, uh, my Star Wars playing cards. It's from a different deck of cards. I had to make sure that one card didn't mess, match the rest of them. I also had to position it at the 17th card and all of the things had to fall into place to make that work. So thanks for the love, everyone. But what's even crazier than that, what's even crazier than the fact that you knew that the eight of diamonds was going to be at the 17th position is the fact that this card did truly come from a different deck of cards. Huh. Remember, all of these have a different back design, right. but this back design, these red cards, these cards aren't even printed. <laughs> oh, wow. Every red card. <laughs> They're actually blank. All of these cards are bright blank. The only <laughs> printed card in the deck of cards was the Eight of Diamonds. Oh. <laughs> okay. Oh. And if that doesn't give you something to think about over the next few hours, I do not know what will. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Ben. That is oh, my awesome. pleasure.
I mean, here's the thing. Here's the thing. The theme of this meeting is uh, it's managing oneself, right? And truthfully, to do that trick, to get you to say the only one that wasn't printed, I had to manage you. <laughs> I actually had to manage all of you so that you'd say the right number and the right everything. But I'm going to close strong. I'm going to do one more. We're okay. going to do one more. I'm going to leave the Eight of Diamonds out of the deck. And I'm going to have, let's see, let me get one more person here. How about, oh, I see Sarah Kane. Sarah, I've enjoyed your art talks over the last few months. How about... Let me go with Patricia. Patricia, how's it going? Great, thank you. I'm great. Oh, I'm good. I'm good too. Thank you for uh, <laughs> thank you for being here, <laughs> Patricia. Do you have a a favorite card in a deck of cards? Um, I'd say Queen of Hearts. Queen of Hearts, fair choice, right? It was totally up to you. <laughs> Because this entire deck of cards that wasn't printed moments ago, they were blank moments ago. Look. You can see them. <laughs> oh, wow. Now you can see they are all printed. Yes. Which is pretty amazing. But here's the thing. I gave all of you free choices. At the start, you could have said red or black. It was up to you. You guys, as a group, went with red. Then you could have said hearts or diamonds. You went with diamonds. Then, of course, you said eight. The eight of diamonds was the only card missing from the deck. And then lastly, but not least, Lee, Patricia, I gave you one more chance to give us a random card. Patricia, I want you to tell everyone honestly, please be honest. Did we talk before my performance? Nope. Honestly, we didn't honestly. set anything up. I didn't text you. <laughs> AJ didn't send a message on my behalf. No. You're positive that Melissa didn't say, hey, you got to help out for this trick. I want you to say the, uh, the, the queen of hearts. It's important. That didn't happen. It was truly a fair choice, completely up to you. Yes. I want everyone to do something for me. Grab your cell phones. I know you have your phones handy. If you have Instagram, I would like you to open the Instagram app. If you don't have Instagram, that's okay. You can just go to the World Wide Web and put in Instagram.com and then slash. If you're in Instagram, I want you to go and search for me. You'll put a, click the magnifying glass and you'll get, you're gonna type in my name. And if you don't have Instagram and this is in your web browser, just type Instagram.com slash my name. And my name is Ben, B-E-N. And my last name is Seidman, S is in Sam, E-I-D is in David, M-A-N. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead and, uh, oh, some of you are freaking out, I can tell. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, Maddie, are you there? <laughs> that's a good sign. I want you all to actually look at the last thing I posted. I posted it over an hour ago. I posted a photo. If you have it pulled up on your phone, Hold it up to your screen. Hold it up. Go ahead and hold it up to your screen. Okay, Carol, hold that right there. I'm going to replace the spotlight so everyone can see. Carol, that's the Queen wow. of Hearts, the no one way. card that Patricia thought of. <laughs> <laughs> and to make sure, oh, by the way, Patricia, you have an email from Isaac you should get to. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I wanted all of you to pop that open on your own screen oh so you can actually see the timestamp and see that I truly posted that like an hour and a half ago before we even began. Two hours ago. Two hours ago, that's right. Uh, I just want to say, oh honestly, to AJ <laughs> and Melissa and, uh, and, and to Jack, to everyone there, it's been such an honor and a pleasure getting to perform for you over the last few months. Uh, truly, it's, it's been an honor. I love you all. I feel like I've become part of the SMA family. And, yeah. uh, and, and because, because the, uh, the, the theme is managing oneself, I'm going to work on, I'm going to do some internal work on myself and manage myself too. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Ben. Thank you, Ben. Oh, you're just incredible. Okay. Ben's been entertaining us now for the last 30 some odd weeks. He's just amazing. Yes, he is. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go on to our next uh, part of the town hall. Uh, we're now going to show you one of the many ways in which we've uh, transformed us over the last five years. Our culture of transparency and focus on responsiveness has actually made us a very different firm today have a 40 year history, uh, but I think the last five years has been an incredible, uh, just an incredible period of, of reinvigoration for us as a firm and as all the individuals in the firm. 
the, we, we all know that the technical qualifications and the experience of our individuals is only really about 20% of having a successful project. The other 80% is really about cultural fit of each individual to the client's specific expectations of their contribution. I'm talking about individual contribution from Drucker and the culture of the client's project team. We and every successful consulting firm knows this, but it's treated as a secondary consideration at best or the first reason why a project fails. Every one of us had at least one experience, if not many experiences of a miserable project assignment. A central theme to managing oneself is knowing enough about yourself to avoid those situations. We created a concept, this is still in development, um, and one of the things that we're really trying to do is try out new ideas in terms of how to improve our business as, in terms of our responsiveness to our employees and our clients. So we, we've created a concept which we refer to as professional characteristics. These are those aspects of each of us that characterize how we think, how we best contribute, how we work effectively with others. It's the soft skills. So we've taken this 40 year experiential knowledge in our, in our business in terms of how we assign folks to, uh, to projects and, and view you know, projects as being uh, different degrees of success and built some artificial intelligence uh, around it that helps our talent, our clients, our staff today with project assignments. Amanda Traxter is one of our consultants that uh, helps companies with competitive proposals. It's gonna actually show us during the next few minutes how this tool works for our associates. So can we highlight Amanda? And, and thank you, Amanda, for, for taking the time to do this for us. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, share my screen uh, so you can actually see what I've got set up. It's super easy to do the um, actual survey, if you will, if I can call it that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if you let me know. And Amanda, if we can ask you to just speak a little bit more loudly, that'd be great. Oh, sure, okay. sorry about that. Is this better? Yeah, that is much better. Okay, great, sorry. And is everyone able to see um, the actual, the screen with the professional characteristics survey? We can. We can. Okay, great, so I'm just gonna dive in. It's super easy. Um, I've done this a couple times and one of the things that I uh, always make sure to do is there, a lot of these, I could be three straight in the middle, but I try to choose my dominant one. So um, you can just watch as I go through and do that. So I definitely make lists. One of the things I can say as I go through this, um, do I keep a clean room? Hmm, kind of. Uh, <laughs> You have to make sure that every bullet point is actually filled out. Anyone who know, who's worked on a project with me knows that I'm not just energetic. I can get a little high strong. Okay, so once you've got every bullet point filled out, then you can get to the continue to the next page. I think I'm pretty organized. Organized. Let's see, I think I work best alone. Oh, I definitely try to be a planner. Let's see. Well, I'm all on this side. Some of these are hard questions. It, um, you think so? <laughs> <laughs> They're not supposed to be, though, but they do. Oh, okay. Do you think. Yeah. Again, um, oh, I think I definitely keep my options open. Uh, I like to fix things. I don't try to fix people anymore. I probably talk too much, like right now. Uh, let's see. Try to get my work done right away. Well, I stay at home now, but generally that's probably the case as well. <laughs> and I also like to see the big picture of things. So, all right, and just one more. Pairs up. Oh, I think I can uh, yell. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. I can <laughs> miracle. We can. Kind of work hard. Well, I think I'm okay with emotions. I actually try to avoid public speaking, but this is cyber speaking, so <laughs> and I definitely like to know why. <laughs> then I've, I've done all of it, so now I have the option to save and review, so I'm going to click that. And then, or because I'm actually not going to review it, so now I have the option to save and submit. Mm -hmm. And then once I submit it, it's actually going to bring up my summary, which it's thinking about. And there we go. It's right there. So apparently, attention to detail, emphasis, written communication, creativity, 
but still some logic. Competitive environment always blows my mind, but I guess that's fair. Uh, high quality content creation, definitely. And then a team that creates and adheres to a structured work plan. Ha ha, that is my ideal. So I'd say it's <laughs> spot on. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. I, that's, uh, thank, first of all, thank you for showing us how this works and, and also for the courage you have for sharing a little bit about yourself. <laughs> really do appreciate that. You're welcome. Great. So we're going to come back to this topic by showing how our clients and account managers use this concept as well. And so we can actually think about how we make a really good fit between our people and particular project situations. But first, we're going to actually have some fun. We're going to hear from Sarah Kane. And we're going to learn about the anonymous and enigmatic street artist, Bansky. Sarah, over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, AJ. Um, so yes, we, today we're learning about Banksy, who I'm sure some of you have heard of. Um, Banksy, whose real identity is unknown, is a British street artist and has gained global fame for the political and social commentary he portrays through his art. So he's known for bombing, which is the word he uses to describe when he puts up his art. So he's known for bombing public spaces and gain traction in his hometown of Bristol. And, you know, now he's bombed everywhere from Detroit to Barcelona. The, uh, the piece behind me is um, one of his works in Detroit. Uh, you can see it's a little boy um, with, uh, that has, you know, painted the wall saying, I remember when this was all trees. Um, he rarely, Banksy rarely does in-person interviews, but when he does, he always protects his identity by wearing a paper bag over his head or a mask. He's very, very secret. Um, so Banksy found his signature stencil style early in his career, and he was drawn to it because it was a quick way to bomb public spaces. You know, he's not standing, he doesn't want to stand there for hours hand painting or hand spraying a wall for risk of getting caught. Um, and he also says that stencil artwork was used historically to start revolutions and end wars. As well, he's used different symbols like rats and policemen to communicate his anti-authoritarian style, as we'll look at in a moment. But Binksy is so prolific with his work because he's able to comment on society in such a way by using humor, by using his anonymity, and the kind of way he goes about putting up his art makes his pieces very kind of graspable. He's sometimes making these very heavy political statements, but in a very relatable way. So let's look at some of his art. So this is titled Girl with Balloon. It's a series that Banksy started in 2002. And since then he's done multiple iterations of this piece. And this particular one, sold uh, for a Banksy record at a Sotheby's auction in 2018. Um, I think there is a video that says it was somewhere in the 800,000s. I also read it was uh, just over a million, but it was a Banksy record at the time. But what's interesting about this piece is that shortly after the sale went through in the auction house, the picture was shredded by the frame that Banksy had custom built. So I'll go ahead and put a link in the chat of the video that shows it shredding, and I highly recommend watching. Um, it shows Banksy building the frame and the moment the shredder goes off in the auction room. And uh, the work was then given a new title of Love is in the Bin. This is uh, the piece after it was shredded. And it's said that because of this stunt, this unique piece is now worth over $2 million. So. I just think it's kind of funny that, you know, he's selling his street art in a very prestigious auction house. And by shredding the art, he's kind of commenting on the irony of it all in a way. Uh, Sarah, can we just pause for a second? I want to make yeah. sure that everyone can see your video. Um, they should, I, she should be able to see it, AJ. Um, I believe oh, I'm spotlight. Yeah. You're spotlighted? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. All right, I just got a few messages that some oh. can't see your video for some reason, but oh, sorry about interrupting. Go okay, ahead. no worries. Want to make sure everyone can see. Um, so yes, this was then, um, you know, valued more than the original piece, which is slightly ironic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so this piece, uh, it's titled Jungle Refugee Camp. So this piece is a prime example of the socio-political statements that Banksy makes with his art. So here Banksy uses Steve Jobs to highlight the Syrian refugee crisis. 
The original one was made in Calais, France, which is a refugee camp with hundreds of people living in tents. And in a statement about this work, Banksy said, quote, we're often led to believe migration is a drain on the country's resources, but Steve Jobs was the son of a Syrian migrant. Apple is the world's most profitable company. It pays over $7 billion a year in taxes, and it only exists because they allowed in a young man from Homs. Mm-hmm. So we can see how, you know, we, you can see in, in, the, in this photo, the tents, the garbage, the other graffiti in this migrant community. And Banksy uses his work to comment on the government's lack of aid for these people by highlighting that one of the wealthiest men that created one of the world's most groundbreaking technologies was the son of a Syrian immigrant. Hmm. Um, I love this one. I think this is really funny. So this is called Spy Booth. This was done in 2014, just after Edward Snowden released um, information of you know widespread phone tapping from Western nations. And it shows three government spies in brown trench coats listening to the, the telephone booth conversation. And this is actually near... Uh, the UK's government communications headquarters in Cheltenham. And I love, I mean, there's not much to say on this. The, the piece kind of speaks for itself, which is why I love Banksy so much. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, they're just, the, his, his work, it's very easily uh, understandable and graspable, even though he's making these political comments. <laughs> so this one was posted on April, 8, uh, April 15th of this year on Banksy's Instagram amidst you know, the initial coronavirus uh, lockdown orders. And he's long used rats as a symbol for social and political commentary. But what I love about this one is that it just seems pure fun. Um, I'll go ahead and zoom in on a piece of the bathroom. Um, You could just see the innovation and the detail that he put into his bathroom, you know, the rat holding up the mirror, the rat squeezing the toothpaste. You know, as well, this piece is unique because it probably won't be seen in person by anyone. You know, Banksy is known for doing these big public bombings, but, you know, obviously he wants to keep his anonymity and, you know, thus will not be inviting the public over to his house. So I highly recommend looking up Banksy on Instagram or on his website. He has countless murals and pieces to look through that, you know, obviously can't be included in this presentation. Some funny, some serious, uh, but he's really so talented. He's one of the most popular, if not the most popular street artist in the world. And um, I hope you learned a little something new about art today. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. That was, that was really fascinating. We were talking about values earlier, and clearly he's an artist who really depicts his values via his art. Absolutely. Even, even the, 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 the piece of art that was shredded and increased in value. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly ironic, but yes. Indeed, yeah. So thank you so much. Our Art Talk series has really been one of the most popular and thought-provoking segments in our company meetings and town halls. So thank you so much. Thank you. I I look forward to it every week. (laughs) You do too. (laughs) So in the the next, we're going to move on to our next segment. In the next uh, four minutes, we're going to try to keep this to four minutes so we can leave some time for some more questions uh, with Bernie. Our Chief Operating Officer, Jacques Keats, is going to demonstrate how we use that same concept of professional characteristics to help make project assignments. Our goal here is to make the information transparent and available so we can make better assignment decisions for our associates and our clients and our employees. Our associates can make better uh, decisions about the assignments that they want to take on. So it's not a filter. It's really to open up the opportunities and increase the information flow so we can all make better, uh, better informed decisions. So Jacques, let's see if we can do this in a handful of minutes. Absolutely. Uh, can you all see my screen? Yes. So, you know, as AJ, as AJ mentioned, you know, a big part of what we do with Todd is is, find, is finding the, you know, the, the hard skills, you know, things like roles. Um, and I'm going to do this very quickly. Um, uh, for example, you know, a role around, uh, say, let's capture, capture a proposal. Maybe uh, we'll look at a volume lead very quickly. Uh, let's do a tech volume lead. Those are always you know, a little more a little more difficult to, to, to find. Um, and then, you know, market areas, you know, again, what your experiential activities. So maybe something in healthcare, um, you know, to, to start, and you'll notice as I'm making selections in, in this list, um, you know, we're, we're, we're moving down to the list. In fact, there's Amanda uh, just came up on the list. <laughs> I've got some healthcare experience. Um, 
and then and customers, you know, where, where, you know, what kinds of programs have people supported? Maybe something, um, you know, in the army space. And, you know, as we, as we're looking at this, you're starting to see, uh, you know, a variety of, of information um, around, around the uh, skill sets of the individuals. Um, they're, they're fit to the particular market area and customer um, and so on. In fact, you know, we, you know, we've got Lee Manti here at the top, very strong. Um, and Amanda's also, you know, got a lot of experience in this space. So, you know, how do you know who to select and, and, and what's, what's the fit? And, you know, when you think about fit, it could be the fit of the proposal manager to, you know, to the client, the fit of the, the team to itself. And so there's some complexities with that. And as AJ mentioned when he was, when he was introducing Amanda, uh, the, the idea of professional characteristics. Amanda showed us the, the 32 questions that we ask associates to complete. And what we've done is we've aligned those to 12 areas where clients can identify where the criticality is um, in terms of, of things that are important to them. You know, so for example, um, when we look at degree of independence, um, yeah, you know, for, you know, a highly collaborative uh, environment, for example, uh, might, be, might be one that we want to consider. Um, you know, problem solving skills, um, you know, is, is another, um, you know, where a client may be looking for somebody who's wants to you know, rely on the big picture rather than, um, than, than focus on, uh, on, on a particular thinking style. And also looking at uh, team dynamics, um, you know, might be another where, you know, some, you know, nurture, you know, some, somebody who's going to work well in a nurturing environment. And, you know, the thing that, that was hard about, about implementing the AI AJ talked about is the fact that, you know, there's no, it, humans are not black and white. We're not binary creatures. And so as a result, there has to, there had to be a degree of, of alignment and consideration around the degree of fit associated to each of those based on those 32 questions that an individual answers. So when I go ahead and hit, uh, and I select this, uh, option. The system is now running and applying these and weighting uh, all of this are based on the information we've provided, the, the skill set, the market area, the end customer, and, and the, uh, the uh, professional characteristics. And Amanda, you know, has now moved into the, into the top position around, around that. Um, and so as we think about fit, you know, and Bernie was talking about the fact that, you know, alignment to culture and alignment to fit is so important. Um, you know, it might be okay to have somebody who's not got quite as much end customer experience, but it's actually going to going to play well with the rest of the team becomes important. And just to give you some perspective, if I were to select the opposites of these um, and go to the you know the opposites of what Amanda has, um, we're going to see somebody else bubble up to the top um, as a function of these activities. And so. It puts a, it, it allows us to consider the, you know, the alignment of the individual to the particular culture of the company or the culture of the team that this individual has to, has to move into. So in this instance, Lee, bubble, Lee bubbled up to the top. So, um, you know, and the thing to keep in mind as you're using these features and capabilities is, is that your proposal manager may need to have a different set of fit and capability than the, 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 the teammates that are going to be uh, supporting that activity with him. And so all of those things can, can come into play as, as we develop and build the team that we would use to select um, our, you know, a particular uh, team for a proposal or a project. So AJ, back to you. Thank you, thank you, Jacques. So um, we just want to expose, uh, show this to, to everyone. It's uh, kind of a, one of the new things that we've been doing. We think it is a very important thing uh, and we're gonna continue to refine this to get it right. And to, again, it's not meant to filter opportunities uh, from other, other directions, it's really meant to be informative for, for everyone so that everyone can make a, a better decision. Thanks, Jacques. So we have some time for, for, uh, for questions. Um, why don't we take the next few minutes? Um, Bernie, are you still with us? I'm still with it, yes, yes, Great. here I am. Let me scroll back up. If anyone wants to raise their hand um, and speak and just ask us a question directly, please go ahead and do so. Well, AJ, while you're looking, if I can ask a question, um, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that I was, you know, I've always been interested in relative to, to Drucker is understanding, you know, the, what, what, what risks do, does a company assume initially as they start to roll, you know, introduce or implement, um, you know, the Drucker approach? Yeah, I mean, you know, so uh, I'm going to use a Drucker phrase to, <laughs> to, to kind of solve that one. Uh, so one of Drucker's wonderful phrases is that you're constantly in an organization managing continuity and change. Because if you're completely 
playing, you know, trying to figure out what the business of the future is going to look like. Uh, so you're constantly in this sort of change mode. You're never going to be profitable. You, you've got to manage the current business model and hit the targets, the revenue targets, the financial targets, the economic targets. And at the same time, allocate a good senior manager is allocating 15 to 20 percent of the time to the future. Where do I need to take the company? Right. So, you're, so the balance is managing two time periods, managing continuity and managing change. And so I would argue that if you try to embed a Drucker like organization, uh, which has a set of principles and I'm happy to kind of go through at some point in more detail, then that's also a continuity and change. You'd manage it like you would in any transformational program where you're not going to bet the farm all at once, but you're going to slowly uh, run some pilots, do some experiments, play some things out and run it like classical change management to really have a point of view of the vision. You get the guiding coalition together, you run some pilots, and then eventually you start to embed this as a, as a more systematic way to do. So you manage the transition from non-Drucker-like to Drucker-like in the way you'd manage any other transformation that's unfolding uh, in the company. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, Bernie, here's an interesting uh, question. There's actually a lot more questions than we have time to, unfortunately, to, to, um, to spend on. But um, can you talk about the difference between the walk and the talk in personal slash professional integrity? If a company's values do not match our personal slash professional values, and we see no route to favorably influencing the company's values, what does a person of true integrity do? They leave the organization. I mean, that, that's, a, that's a pretty clear cut case, right? Because so, so if, if, I, if I've done the work saying, here are five values that are really, really important to me. I've joined an organization that were value aligned on paper, and it turns out they're not going that, I, I don't have a choice. The changing values for an organization is, is, if they're not living their values, that, that's really a low integrity organization from my perspective. That's not a place I want to be. So I, I think that it's very clear that, you know, 99% of the time I'd say you leave, the, leave that organization, unless you feel there's some way in which you can influence the evolution of values, which is a tough game to play. So all else equal, 99% of the time, you're going to want to move on. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Bernie. Um, I, you had mentioned earlier that I think uh, there was, uh, you have a list of his great books and, and a syllabus around which uh, you teach his classes. So can you share that with us and we can share it with our attendees? Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm happy. To, I, I have a class called The Great Books of Drucker where I have seven of his books and I have some guiding questions. Uh, I have a, a course called Drucker Philosophy where I have a set of materials also. The other thing that I have, AJ, which is probably more important probably, is I've, a, I've, I've boiled his work down to 10 core principles with behavior anchors. So if you want to score SMA, this would be an interesting exercise. Let's score SMA on the 10 principles and get everybody's feedback. As to where they think. So that's going to, so there's a diagnostic tool I have also, AJ, that I'm happy to share with folks. So yeah, the, it, no problem at all. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Bernie. So um, please hang on. I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. I know we've got, we're almost at the very top of the hour. Uh, we actually have one last bit of fun left for everyone, but at next week's town hall, I want to mention we're going to have Nicholas Lloyd of Lindy Beige talk about money, and that will be exciting for sure. So thank you for spending time with us, and special thanks to Bernie, Ben, Amanda, Sarah, and to Elizabeth Stillman, Melissa Miller, and Marie Murphy for helping us produce this event. Before we close, please stay on for a few more minutes for a bit of fun. So over to you, Jacques. Hey, Jay. Uh, you know, one of the things that... Uh, you know, we do even even at headquarters. We we put together a number of, of projects, and there was one that we re that that you actually tasked us to do recently. And so we actually did use that. We found a project manager, we found a writer, an engineer, um, a production lead, and we even used some SMEs. And before I, you know, and, and we we got lucky because we got to actually chronicle this via video. Um, and okay. I really want to take the time to uh, thank you know Tom Paisley, Chris Jude, Greg Ward. And you know, I got I, I got to, to to work with some very you know some very talented people on this. So I'm going to go ahead without any further ado and and you know show you what a project at SMNA really looks like. <laughs> okay, can't wait. RFP just dropped. Awesome, Todd. Let's ride. <laughs> If I could be anyone, I'd be your trusted hired gun. I'm gonna make us a plan. Gonna take us right into the promised land. Your proposition can't be beat, but there is word on the street. 
you got a rival at hand Don't waste another minute and give it all that you can I got some mighty fine friends that are ready to ride They are the best in the business and they will provide Say the word and they'll be at your side, that's for sure just let us try, we will succeed, your satisfaction guaranteed. Don't be left pounding that sand. We do more than just watch your back. We get you on your track, you get what you need with talent on demand. Succeed, your satisfaction's guaranteed. Don't be left pounding that sand. We do more than just watch your back. We get you on your track, don't do it alone. Unless you need another heart attack, come get what you need with talent on demand. On demand. Awesome. All right. That was brilliant. Good job, guys. <laughs> that was good, guys. <laughs> that, that was very creative and a lot of fun. Oh. And, uh, well, I have to give we have to we have to give you know a, a huge shout out to Tom Paisley who you know who uh, wrote wrote the music, Chris Jude who did all the engineering, um, you know Gr Greg you know developed uh, you know some of the guitar work and um, you know of course I played bass on on this particular. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. That was awesome. Good job, guys. Good job. Awesome. Fantastic. How are you? Yes. <laughs> I think we're going to make good use of that video. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and when, when venues open up again, maybe you guys will go live. <laughs> Well, you know, we've been talking about, um, you know, when, when all this is over and we get everybody together, we'll, you know, we'll bring the talent and, and some of the folks together to, to do something where we can be in one room. Maybe a new tool for our, our account executives. Um, every time a client <laughs> hires, hires us for a gig, they get, they get a live performance. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you everyone for joining this week's town hall. It was, uh, it was a blast, a lot of fun, and really appreciate all of your, your participation. Uh, it's great when, uh, when it's interactive and um, I know the limitations of Zoom, but it, uh, you know, we're able to use the chat window and other ways just to make this a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's being successful. It's not just about working hard. It's also about having fun. So, so thanks, everyone. <laughs>